Hi, and welcome to Let's Talk, the show that brings you the most important conversations in art, culture, and ideas. Um, today I have with me Essie Shaker. He's a well-known photographer, uh, author of several books, including a, a rather large tome called Grit and Grace, uh, The Grandeur of Monochromatic Malaysia. Uh, that's an old work, but, and we'll come to that. I wanted to pick your mind, uh, Shaker, for, um, I guess, the conversation about technology and photography today, just because it's so advanced. Um, but maybe before we get to that, you can tell me a little bit about yourself or audience who might not know your own trajectory in photography. Right. Well, uh, right after university, I, I decided to um, not practice what I was trained to do and go into... Um, uh, photography and journalism, uh, photojournalism, and what I did was I, I joined a local newspaper, uh, The Star. This was in 1980, and uh, joined them as a photojournalist and worked with them for quite a few years. Th those were the early days where I learned so much about um, uh, photojournalism uh, and in, in the local context as well. We had, had excellent teachers uh, from around um, uh, Malaysia. I was posted to different areas in the country, and, and yeah, so that's how it first started. Can I ask you though, I mean, what is it that you trained for, and did it in any way inform the way you looked at the world? Yeah, I was trained as a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I see the lawyer in your work, but never mind. So I, I don't know your early work, uh, but that's an interesting transition, isn't it? Well, but there's so many of us who have done this, you know, you know who don't practice what they've trained to do. Uh, again, it's a calling. It's something that you must want to do, something that you must really, uh, you know, you, you want to wake up in the morning, that's what you want to do. This is that, that burning desire to wake up in the morning and do something that's creative. Right. Um, Was it storytelling? Because there is a very strong sense of storytelling in photojournalism, right? right? Because it works, as it were, within a kind of journalistic context. It's the news, it's what's happening, what's breaking, uh, and the larger stories that the, uh, the context in this, country, in this case, maybe the country, right? Um, is that what was um, compelling for you, the ability to tell stories? Yes, I think that was always been, that's always been, it still is, uh, the reason why I even take pictures because I think every image that you take, everything that you do, you must mean something. And if it means something to you, then I'm sure it'll go, it's going to mean a lot to somebody else as well looking at those pictures. So uh, as a photographer, you have this responsibility to tell the story uh, in a way uh, that everybody can understand. You don't have to make it abstract. You can if you want to, but really it's about uh, telling how you look at something. I, I want to ask you though about the local Malaysian newspaper, right, in, in time the star because it was one of the bigger newspapers, is the, um, is the play that photographers get in their work gets within the newspaper and the pages. You know, sometimes f photographs are just illustrations of the story. Sometimes they are the main feature, right? right? In, in the Malaysian context, were f photographers given that space for that pictures could lead? Well, you know, well, when I first joined the newspapers, there were some excellent editors who looked at the pictures and gave it the, the uh, prominence it deserved. There are some very, very good pictures that were completely not associated with any story. A photographer would go out, take this brilliant picture of something that's happening in town, and then we'd write a story about it. Uh, so, yeah, there were... Uh, editors who could spot this kind of thing. They were very, very good. Some of the editors I worked with was um, uh, Gobin Rudra uh, and Cheryl Dorrell. These people were there and uh, N.B. Raman and these people were there they were very sharp and they looked at this image and they said, all right, double page spread. And they turned the paper around and do this, you know, it was a, it star was a tabloid. So they would do stuff with it and it would just completely break all the rules just because this picture uh, was very powerful. Uh, of course, on an everyday basis, you had uh, the photographers going out for assignments, just taking pictures to support uh, a story. All right? So you had both things. But it was really up to the photographer himself or herself to go out and create these uh, images. There's things happening all around town. I remember I used to have a column in the Star those days we'd, where we'd, I'd photograph a section of a building and then 
and then the, the last page would have a little the whole picture and it will tell them a story about the building. So it made people go out and pay attention to little details in architecture. So that was something that ran for about five or six years. It was a very good. When did you leave uh, journalism and branch out into the kind of work that uh, is also kind of, in a sense, you know, made you as a professional? I mean, uh, photojournalism in a newspaper doesn't pay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it and clearly you've moved on from that. So what, where was the transition? Where did you go? And well, uh, I'd worked, I think working in the star gave me some basic um, parameters. I knew I couldn't do this. Uh, work as a photojournalist in Malaysia alone, so I moved on. I worked in Hong Kong, I worked in the Philippines, and worked in the U.S. Uh, in, in New York, uh, gaining experience, gaining um, uh, going around and traveling and seeing the world. And then finally coming back to Malaysia, I decided that I wanted to focus on areas where I felt local photographers were not doing enough. And what was what were those? Well, well basically, uh, looking at uh, architecture, looking at uh, uh, people, uh, looking at um, our indigenous communities. Right. I was always very, very interested in that because when I was in the states, I used to look at the works of the photographers in the 30s during the Great Depression. Uh, people like Eugene Smith and um, quite a few other photographers who spent a lot of time documenting. Um, the country during uh, a very difficult period and the Great Depression in the 30s was one such period and those pictures I found to be fascinating because they were the raw images of the country uh, that I felt um, really uh, were the foundation blocks for how America would then continue and, and, be, and evolve and, and become uh, what it is today. So I found those pictures were important, They're very important because people needed to see where they came from. And, and, and for us in Malaysia, um, I found that um, the British did that while they were here, they photographed, but then it was not uh, our point of view, it was a point of view of, yeah, of, of the British, of the colonial colonizers, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. So the, the way they took pictures was different, were different. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for me, I felt that uh, as a local, as a Malaysian, uh, I needed to do it myself. So I spent every weekend going into um, uh, uh, our jungles, going into our Oragasli uh, indigenous uh, villages and going, spending time with them and st slowly started to uh, photograph and document. Right. Were you at all interested in that other trajectory that photography had, uh, and perhaps always had, right, uh, with... Um, overt uh, sort of uh, so art artistry as it were you know the taking uh, photographs into a very different <coughs> way still lives but imaginative ones using uh, all kinds of technologies uh, that we might associate today with you know, photoshopping for instance mm -hmm. you know um, did you ha were you interested at all in that uh, sort of taking it in a kind of a magical surrealistic uh, direction well, I think uh, photography, is all, photography has always offered those uh, things. Even those days, during um, the, the days of the dark room, people still did manipulation. They did this. And, uh, and it's just to a lesser extent uh, because of what you could physically do in the dark room. Uh, but uh, when it came to um, uh, moving on into trying to manipulate images to... to uh, give you a different kind of a story. Like that, montage that, work. Yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't keen on that at all. Right. all right. Okay, so you've been pretty much true to um, sort of depicting the world as it is. And I, but I want to ask you this, right? So what is it for a photographer to think about reality? When you look at the work uh, in that book I mentioned, start uh, m the monochromatic Malaysia, obviously we're verdant green jungles and then you rendered them all in shades of black and white and yeah. grays right yeah. so why that w w what is it that's going in your mind through your mind when you think about making that kind of interpretation of the landscape i think sometimes um, if you remove the embellishment of color you see the land for what it is all right imagine this beautiful beach, blue seas, 
and then suddenly you find this yellow plastic bag <laughs> on, on the beach. It just completely, uh, you know, ruins the whole shot, you know. It's so much so you'll have to go and pick it up. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is, so you don't need color sometimes. Uh, for me, the color uh, didn't actually have um, a point. I was trying to show the country from the air. Most of the pictures were taken from a helicopter. And you didn't need the color. You just looked at the textures uh, and there was enough. Right. Was a lot of it is about form, isn't it? Yeah, it's form um, and texture. Yeah. Form and texture. So, where do you go with, with work like that? I mean, and where is it that the technology is allowing you to do things that you weren't able to do, say, 20 years ago? Uh, because I know you, you're a bit of a techie buff type, and I've seen your workspace mm -hmm. with your fancy cameras. So tell us, <laughs> where is technology taking photography today? Well, there's all this AI that's coming into the picture now. You find that uh, uh, Photoshop has just created this new uh, plugin. It's not even a plugin; it's part of the whole Photoshop uh, system itself, where you can take a picture of a landscape with a terrible gloomy sky and AI within Photoshop will actually replace it and give you any sky you want. That kind of uh, uh, technology is now available to everyone. Everyone. Now, I don't think that's a good thing. You don't think it's a good thing? Well, well you, you can do it, but what's the point? I mean, if I wanted to take a nice picture of a landscape, I'd sit around and wait. And sometimes I'd wait for days or weeks, and then you'd come back, and then you'd study the landscape again, and then start taking pictures. If you wanted that particular um, uh, beautiful sky, you just have to wait for it. See, we think it's very interesting, and I, when you read about, say, Annie Leibovitz, some of these yeah. photographers who have these amazing portraits, yeah. and when you learn the backstory, that they literally waited for the moment, or exactly. took thousands of photographs before yeah. the right one, and this is even before digital was available. Exactly. So taking a photograph was a cost to the photographer, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Right? But, so what, what, what is the value in that? I mean, as you as a photographer, the weighting, the, the cost, and weighing up the, you know, the trade-offs of taking this photograph right now as opposed to waiting because the film stock's going to run out. I mean, what does that teach you as a photographer? The satisfaction of being able to capture what it is you feel, not just what you see. Because now, Photoshop is able to do that. It can just give you what you want to see, and it's, it's doing that for you. But the satisfaction of sitting down and waiting, and during that wait, you're thinking about so many things, you're feeling so many things, and all that has a part to play in the final image. Um, and that's, that's how every one of the pictures that I've taken for the book was. I'd go up in a helicopter at enormous costs, 8,000 ringgits an hour going up on a helicopter and we'd shoot and sometimes I'd go out deliberately just before a storm started because I wanted those dramatic clouds in the sky. I wanted the rain pouring down. It's possible, uh, but you don't have to fake it. You don't have to fake it. Okay, <laughs> we're going to take a short break and we're going to come back to a discussion of an Oangasli community that Jake has become very interested in and he's taken a lot of images of them and he's also helped them and I want to uh, talk about the relationship between photography and activism in Malaysia. So stay tuned to Let's Talk. Hmm. Ingin dapatkan rambut lembut dan indah setiap hari? Rangkaian Tresemme Care... Bila sentuh soal berita, tiada masa untuk tunggu. Kepada anda kami bawakan fakta, susulan dan kupasan yang terkini. Tiada drama dan tiada pengulangan. Usah tunggu lama-lama. Awani 745 lebih awal dari biasa. Kini berwajah baru. Ini pula susulan khas pesawat Back Air di Kazakhstan. Pesawat berkenaan dilaporkan tergelincir dua kali. Notifikasi berita terkini dan navigasi mudah. Podcast dikemas kini dengan berita dan program. Reba, reformasi, resistance and hope. Serta video tanpa hard dengan scroll tanpa henti. 
Buat turun aplikasi baru Astro Awani sekarang. Gagalan Kerajaan Persekutuan Tunai Janji melaksanakan projek baik pulih sekolah daif turut diulas Menteri Muda Pendidikan dan Penyelidikan Teknologi Dr. Anwar Rapai. COVID-19, dua lagi kes disyaki atau PUI direkodkan di Sarawak. So, hopefully kita akan mendapat kedudukan yang lebih baik di masa-masa akan datang. Udang geragau atau bubuk dalam bahasa tempatan terkenal sebagai bahan utama dalam pembuatan belacan atau cincaluk. Amanah di tangan kita. Welcome back to Let's Talk. I'm Shohad Kutun with me, Essie Shaker, photographer. We've been talking about um, his trajectory to photography. Uh, now I'm going to turn a little to something that's happening out in Pahang. Uh, Shaker, help us understand, because a year ago we wanted to do the story mm -hmm. with you, and then of course, you know, the political crisis, yes, yeah. the COVID crisis, everything yeah. is, you know, kind of uh, puts a stop to that. But that story continues because obviously those people that you were very in, uh, concerned about mm -hmm. uh, continue to live in, and they live in conditions that, as you described to me, were appalling. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. you help us understand exactly who this community is and what their situation is? Well, uh, I'll, I'll start um, uh, as to how I actually got to uh, know about this community. I was doing a story on the rivers of Malaysia it was a project, book project that I was doing and, and this brought me to this village uh, to a, a few villages in Muazzam Shah in, in um, Pahang. Uh, Muazzam Shah is actually quite a developed little township um, and it even has a university and it's quite uh, uh, well, uh, uh, what would you say, um, has all the amenities available for, for a city, right? And so when I went there, I discovered there was a landfill, landfill where um, there were these uh, orang asli were actually scavenging from. What they were doing was they're going in and doing recycling work, uh, and not just uh, adults, but children as young as one and a half, two year old, were running around and playing around in this huge landfill. Uh, it was shocking shocking and I'm sure you'll see in the pictures um, how um, uh, horrifying it was. I, I couldn't, you know, I went there first time, second time and I'm thinking, oh my God, this can't be happening in Malaysia. It because be. it happens in other countries. I mean, yes. Smoky Mountain in Manila, very famous landfill, exactly. you know, right. which photographers exactly. have kind of gone to for right. this rather tragic images of people in poverty. Right? Exactly. And and I, I've seen this, you know, as a journalist, I've been around, I've seen this happen in other countries, but never thought it would happen in Malaysia because we were this country with zero poverty and, you know, that's what we've been told. And then you go into this landfill and you see complete opposite. You think to yourself, oh my God, what's happening? This can't be real. There's something essentially wrong here that we need to look at. Interesting when you say, look at, see, photographers go in, they take the photograph, it becomes a story, it raises some uh, hoo-ha maybe, and then they move on. Yeah. But that's not been your relationship to this community, has it? No, I, I've always had um, a sort of a soft spot for our Orang Asli, our indigenous people, um, because there's so much we can learn from them. They are a resource that's completely untapped. Uh, they have so much knowledge on, mm. on traditional medicines, they have so much knowledge about the rainforests, so much we can learn from. And we have not done that. Instead, we're exploiting them. Instead, uh, we're taking away their lands, polluting their rivers. How can we do this? It's wrong. By, by any way you look at it, it's wrong. And I felt that, look, through my camera, through the photography that I do, uh, I'm going to actually show the country, show the leaders, show whoever needs to be needs to see this. They need to look and hey, look, this is how our Orang Asli is uh, they're living. And what year was it that you encountered this community and started doing work? This there? was in, in well, I s first saw them in late 2009. Uh, um, sorry, no, about September of 2019. That's when I first saw this community. 
And I thought to myself, all right, you know, I've got to do something about this. You know, it's not just about photography anymore. You know, uh, people need to see, Malaysians need to see and understand that this is what's happening. Because you can go out and talk to people about this and no one will believe you until you see the pictures. And so that's how it started. Um, I went there every once in two weeks. I'd drive from KL, uh, from PGA, and I would go to Muazzam Shah and stay with them in the landfill. I would go there and spend two nights, three nights, and document what was going on. And that's when I begin to see the whole picture. There's an entire, entire ecosystem that profits from these people working in the landfill. Now, I have no issues with adults doing this kind of work, but there's no place for children. Children have, should not be there. Adults do far more dangerous things around the world, you know, in, in the country. They work in mines, they work in coal mines, and all these things are fine. You know, that's a choice you have, a choice you make. But when it comes to living like this, and then they're all treated so shabbily. Can you imagine in this entire landfill where there's an office where there is water, clean water, uh, and electricity, none of that is given to the Orang Asli, who live just in the periphery of the oh, landfill. Okay, so we know that uh, from you know uh, uh, from many other sort of problems that the Orang Asli communities in in the peninsula have had. Uh, they are institutions. Uh, never mind the the state welfare uh, you know department, but there, there is actually the Jabatan Hal Ehwal Orang Asli, right? Yes, Jakwa. It's meant to deal with uh, the, the concerns of our own asset community. Right. Are they functioning? I mean, what is it that you found out about the institutional support system that's supposed to be there for the community? Well, for a start, they didn't even know where this place was. They called me up and asked me, where is this place? Because I'd made several reports that called out the people in the ministry and finally went to the minister. And then, of course, then I get a call from Jakoa itself asking me, where is this place? So obviously they didn't know that such a place and, and these people actually exist. This is the Jakun tribe. Mm. The Jakun tribe is one of the larger tribes in the country, quite a few of them, spread out across the country. So they didn't know. So I said, all right, fine, I'll tell you where they are. We can go and look at it. Uh, and that was it. And I never heard from them again until the story broke in the newspapers. Then, of course, all hell broke loose, and, you know, People were calling me and people were cursing me. <laughs> Who was cursing you? Well, you know, there are people calling up and say, oh, you shouldn't do this because, you know, it is not good for the image of Malaysia. Can you imagine? <laughs> we're worried about image. <laughs> so then what happens? So um, then what happened was um, um, uh, the minister came. Uh, he made uh, quite a few promises to the Orang Asli. Unfortunately, soon after, there was a change in government. So this would be the Ma Minister of National Unity, would it have been, with uh, Uwe Modi? That's right, yeah. So he went there to try and do what he could. Uh, and of course, um, nothing happened. Nothing happened. And these, the Orang Asli community uh, were banned from entering the uh, uh, landfill to do any more recycling work. But what I was saying about the ecosystem that exploits them is this. Uh, all these uh, or actually go into the landfill, and this is not the only landfill, there are others as well. They go there, they recycle, they take out these things, separate all the garbage, all right? Very hazardous. I've seen, I've even seen medical waste in there, all right? But anyway, uh, they take it and then the middlemen come. They buy it off from, and then it goes to Kuantan, it goes to KL, the recycling work goes. Now, that's fine if you're paying them uh, well. Most of these people get paid nothing. It's such measly sums. Right? It's very, very difficult. So, where is a photographer? And I'm very interested in this. You know, where do you draw the line? Because uh, you have gone beyond photography. You say. Yeah. I mean, is that something that you expect of your fellow photographers? in the business because it, it is a huge commitment, isn't it? Well, it is a huge commitment, but also because that's your responsibility. If you're with a camera, you are telling a story, then you can't just stop halfway. I know what they say about not getting involved with, um, with the work that you're doing, but you cannot. I'm a human being. I'm going to be emotionally affected by what I see, and that's what's going to come out in the images that I, when I, that I take. 
right? Right. So there's been a change of government since, uh, I guess, that moment where the minister came out. And right. uh, uh, what's happened since, especially during this year where we've all been restricted in our movements? Right. Well, what uh, we managed to do before, uh, during that period was we tried to get uh, several NGOs uh, and thank God for them because they did, they've done so much for this community and other communities as well. One of them is the Global Peace Foundation. The other one is Maikase. And then you have the, um, the uh, Center for Orangasli Concern uh, that is run by Dr. Colin Nicholas. And then, of course, you have the ECM Libra, and they have been doing some very good work with some of these <coughs> other NGOs too. Right, they have a foundation. Right? That's right, yeah. So they have been, uh, th these foundations have, I tell you, if, if not for them, uh, these villages would have starved. So they were sending food. Uh, My Kase Foundation was actually embedding uh, the identity cards of the uh, Orang Asli with cash value so that they could actually shop. In, uh, in the local supermarkets, uh, that sort of thing they were doing. And then, of course, um, uh, Global Peace Foundation was actually giving them water supply, wa water filtration devices, uh, and solar power so that they could pump water out from the neighbor, nearby lakes and then have water. Not to drink, because even that was quite... They don't have drinking water. It is very, yeah. very difficult. And from the images I noticed also, I think the skin diseases they get. Yeah, they had the lots of uh, problems, uh, you know, uh, with skin problems because of the hazards and in, in how they live and they have no water to wash. So this is some of the things that, and, they, and they're right next to the highway. This is no excuse for not, you know, pulling a, a water line or a, a power line and giving them what they need. But there's so many villages like this all over the state all over the country that don't have this. So use of uh, kind of really bringing to the fore with this contradiction in Malaysia mm -hmm. between the, those uh, um, artifacts of modernity, the highways, the, the shining buildings, and the fact that so many people, at least a, a good number, perhaps too many, uh, even if it's a small number, uh, living still in poverty and in, in, right. in awful conditions. Um, in the last minute we have, uh, Sheikh, what's next for you as a photographer? Well, I'm going to continue doing this. I think we need to use the camera in a way where we can actually tell the story. And there's so many stories to tell, not just here in the peninsula, in Sabah and Sarawak as well. What's been happening during the pandemic, uh, there's so many things that we need to do. We need to, rec it, we need to record it. So that, you know, future generations will know what had happened. You know what they say, if you don't know where you come from, you never know where you're going to go. Yeah, and with the so, recording comes also, I guess, the inability to deny that it's happening, which right. is something that happens yes, uh, too yeah, often with exactly. officials. So we need to do this. The, every photographer should go out there and use photography as a means to try and uh, tell your story. Tell your story. It doesn't matter what the story is. Tell your story. You need to train yourself. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jacob, for uh, being with us. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. That's all we have on uh, Let's Talk. Uh, I've been speaking to S.E. Shaker. I'm Sharad Kutin, only on Astro One. The third